I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Abhishek Sharma, partner, is a member of the pricing assurance team and assists clients on topics related to price and contract benchmarking, strategic engagement reviews, and sourcing cost rationalization. Rohan Pant, practice director, is a member of the pricing assurance team and leads analysis and price benchmarking pertaining to cloud, infrastructure, and security services. He focuses on global rate card benchmarking across more than 30 locations and the ROI impact of various workplace transformation projects. Shitika Ujain is a practice director on the pricing assurance team where she advises clients on price benchmarking, contract assessment, and solution design and review. Her focus includes leading engagements in the space of applications, consulting, and next generation services. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Abhishek. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome all participants to the webinar today. Uh, we have three main discussion points uh, which we'll cover over the next one hour or so. First, we'll speak a bit about the current macroeconomic environment and its impact on enterprise priorities. Uh, next, we'll examine the expected impact you know, on pricing across services and also touching on software licensing a bit. And then finally, we'll highlight five key actions which enterprises can use to capture uh, overall savings in the Trouble Dust uh, 2023. Uh, we also aim to cover a few questions at the end of this discussion, so do please feel free to share them uh, via the chat, and we'll, we'll be happy to uh, we'll be happy to take take through some of them. Okay, uh, moving forward, um, you know, it, it would be stating the obvious, but macroeconomic uncertainty reigns. Um, multiple indicators point to that. Um, the ten minus two treasury yield spread is highest ever over 40 plus years, uh, and recession probability models do show a bit of an upswing. Now, closer to the ground level, closer to what you know, we, can, we can see, um, no surprise that consumer prices have soared and continue to soar in many geographies. Loan volumes have declined materially. If we look at you know, the bottom left corner, the America's loan volumes, EMEA loan volumes have declined due to high cost of capital. So the chances of depression in demand and low sentiment do seem to be a real possibility. Uh, Noel, I think this also shows in some of the recent key issues study um, that we conducted, right? Do you want to talk through some of that on the next page? Yeah, absolutely, Abhishek. You know, Abhishek, as you rightly pointed out, you know, some of these macroeconomic factors, uh, they seem to have influenced the challenges also. You know, not surprisingly, cost pressure and uh, talent shortage, they occupy the top three ranking. And... Uh, Considering the economic and geopolitical situation, yes, that's absolutely right. And though we do see an easing of the talent situation, you know, when you uh, see the layoffs that, been that have been happening in big product companies, so there is a talent that's coming up in the market. But at the same time, you know, there are some high demand roles such as cloud, which have certainly, uh, there's a lot, a lot of pent up demand that is there in the market currently. So one interesting point that there is, you will see slowdown in demand. Uh, that is something uh, that's come up in the top five after a long time. I think clearly it seems recession is in everyone's mind and that is impacting decision making of a lot of enterprises. We see a lag in the uh, decision making around big time transformations. I mean, uh, we can expect most of these enterprises to have to wait and watch what will happen, how this uncertainty will go away. So uh, apart from this, what we feel is, you know, most of these challenges, they've also shaped some of, key, uh, some of the key priorities. And we've done a similar study for the same. So if we move to the next page. Uh, so, yes. So just before uh, I was having a conversation with Shitika about the same, you know, during COVID time, what happened is no one really anticipated the way digital transformation would take off. And uh, currently also, you know, we see a very similar view by many of the enterprise and service provider stakeholders. So uh, it comes as no surprise, you know, that there is a talk around controlling costs. 
and uh, we see that increased focus on cost optimization and productivity improvement so uh, shitika do you really think you know what's the key takeaway from this list ron i do see a lot of market coherence with the priorities listed out here while cost optimization clearly seems to be the priority as we move ahead in 2023 um it will be very interesting to see how productivity improvement plays out as a key lever for service providers and especially to you know justify some of these increase rate cuts that we saw the last year again last year we did see rate cuts soaring in many deal scenarios um however the slowness in demand brought about by the present recessionary environment uh will make definitely make it difficult for providers to sustain with these increases so my hypothesis says productivity improvement will be used as a lever by service providers to compensate for the high rate increases in a lot of you know the contracts that we saw last year yeah thanks to the ganron so obviously we we've, we've uh, given the audience a sense of what the prioritization seems to be in our you know studies we recently conducted but when we get a quick poll done um on the next page from the participants so um we request you know participants to key in um you know what's going to be the top priority for them in 2023 never an easy question just to just to choose one option but uh, but yeah let's let's see where this takes us oops cost still reigning supreme but the others seem to be if not equal contenders definitely important aspects to cover we'll we'll give it perhaps you know 10 more seconds and then and then close it up all right Five, four, three, two, one. Let's end the poll and see what we got. Okay. Um, so, so as you can see, uh, it's it's interesting that you know obviously cost saving is is top of mind. And that's you know forty nine percent of of the respondents um, you know mentioning that. But uh, it clearly seems that you know tackling. uh the the next three are kind of you know almost at a tie breaker point right tackling the talent shortage the digital transformation productivity and customer experience improvement um shadika what do you think about the the whole element around you know talent shortage still being a material one sixth of the participants you know, mentioning that what <laughs> do, you, do you think that's still going to be pretty much one of the main points for 2023 Actually, Abhishek, it validates our perception of the two picture of the market too, right? Um, the talent shortage continues to be a challenge, even though there's some pockets of layoff happening here and there. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how things unfold going ahead into the year. So interesting times. Absolutely, and uh, Rohan, the the other two elements, you know, digital transformation, productivity, and customer experience improvement. uh actually both these go hand in hand your know, transformation isn't just about cost it's also about you know a lot of it is about experience improvement and efficiency so that's about a total of 31% um you know any any quick thoughts on that yeah. before we move on to yeah, the next absolutely. section absolutely yeah absolutely abhishek you know you're absolutely you hit the nail on the head by saying that these are all related and that is the reason we see you know 31% coming up in uh, digital transformation productivity and customer uh, experience improvement i think from covid you've seen a lot of focus on customer experience improvement and that's got to do with you know a lot of hybrid kind of an environment some enterprises are working from home some from office some doing a hybrid setting so the focus is and you know with impending uncertainty the focus is back on customer experience improvement got it okay perfect right let's uh, let's move on to the next section then we talked about macroeconomic environment till now but then um let's study the expected pricing impact right because that's where the rubber hits the road now as we look at 2023 it's important to see how the overall dynamics of it spend and interplay within components play out post that we can get into a perhaps more detailed discussion on expected increases um rohan you know it it seems that you know if we look at from an enterprise procurement perspective they may need to choose which part of the hardware software services spectrum to focus on 
for cost impact, you know, as we see in the next page. Um, yeah, keen, keen to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely, Abhishek. I think this is very interesting because, you know, from a lens of procurement, if I see there are largely uh, three cost centers, software, hardware, and IT services. Now, you, if you look at hardware, what we've seen is an astronomical increase in price during the last one year. And that's largely to do with some geopolitical factors, you know, Ukraine, Russia war, or whether it's supply chain issues from coming from China. We've seen those chip shortages, and that's reflected in the hardware price, if you look at it. So uh, what we expect this increase to continue in the coming quarters or the year, and it would be really hard to control, you know, the costs around the hardware spend, unless and until there is a major technology disruption that happens. So apart from that, you know, when you look at the software side of it, a very similar story to hardware. So, you know, most of the software licenses that is SaaS based pricing, they're dependent on the hardware also because there's the underlying hardware that's increasing. So it's bound to increase the license price. So, and overall, if you look, there are some commercial levers that we'll talk about later that can be applied, but it's going to be a tough negotiation when it comes to the software side. Now, Coming to the happy news, you know, that is IT services are ripe for some negotiation. So what we've seen is we've already seen a peak uh, in the rate increases. And what we should ideally be seeing now is that slope of increase is now flattening a bit. And that is largely due to moderation of the talent shortage, as well as attrition numbers, if you see, and as well as wage inflation. So I think that is what we see here. IT services has been the sweet spot to negotiate. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when we look at the direction of outsource pricing, um, may I request if we go to the previous page? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So this is this is the one to cover. So there's there's two um, elements, you know, which 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 could potentially play out, right? And um, you know, we are in a unique position. Right? Um, financial analysts globally are divided on whether a proper recession is coming soon or we'll remain at the status quo of what we call continued uncertainty, right? So for potential price impact, uh, we've drawn out two scenarios that may occur. Scenario A, which is basically um, significant economic downturn, as you can see, sharp decrease in demand, major acceleration in frequency of technology layoffs, um, strict high increases, the, the usual stuff that you see uh, related to where demand across the board goes down. Just to be very clear, uh, the scenario on the left, the scenario A, is not what we call economic mayhem, right? So, so because that has totally different dynamics, but but again, you know, a, a good enough, um, you know, recession or or a material enough recession. Now, scenario B is interesting because that's what we would, you know, for lack of a better term, call continued uncertainty. Things continue in cautious mode as they are. So, there's pockets of reduced demand, greater scrutiny, but still things going moving forward. Uh, organizations, you know, just like the recent, you know, tech layoffs we've seen and in certain other sectors also, it's, we see them more as reprioritization, refocusing, you know, of elements rather than, you know, big time um, kind of, you know, layoffs. Um, and, and each of these scenarios, scenario A and scenario B, would have um, their own, um, you know, ramifications in terms of, you know, how pricing is potentially going to be uh, playing out. Um, Shadika, let me hand over to you for the details on the expected price movement uh, moving to the next page. Thanks, Abhishek, for giving our audiences a view on the two possible scenarios that can play out this year. I know there has been a lot of interest among our audiences today to get some understanding of what price movement can be expected going forward. So let me first start talking about the anticipated rate movement in case of a proper recession being the truth of the matter. We anticipate the rate movement to be around one to 2% at onshore and around two to 3% at the offshore locations for traditional skills like Java, .NET, C, C++, and also for traditional infrastructure skills like compute, storage, et cetera. Now, specialized skills like full stack, AI, ML, experience design, um, all of these, the rate increase in the next 12 months is projected to be around three to 4%. So uh, very similar to applications and infrastructure, even uh, business process services like customer support operations and finance accounting will most likely see a very muted rate increase in the typical uh, recession-like scenario, uh, where you know the global slowdown leads to a freezing of the outsourcing spend itself. So um, moving on to the next slide. 
yeah so let me add some color to how the rate movement would look like for the more plausible scenario where enterprises continue with a cautious spend behavior so to say um, so the upward trend in rate increase will most likely be there but the rate of increase itself will be much slower compared to 2022 um, factors like demand layoffs in some quarters um, a persistent fear of recession leading to refrain spending will result in rate increases, which will be um, likelihood of being lower than last year. Now, rates for standard skills are projected to increase around 3 to 4 percent. And in a very uh, similar way, a 3 to 5 percent of you know, uh, rate increases are anticipated for offshore locations. On the other hand, specialized or next generation skills are likely to see a slightly higher increase in the next 12 months. Now, going forward, the trend for price increase in BPS will also continue to be inflationary, yet the rate of increase again will be what much slower due to uh, lower demands again. Abhishek, you have been in the midst of uh, a lot of pricing discussions. What are your thoughts on this? Sure, thanks, Sitaka, for <clears throat> providing an overview of the direction which pricing could take. Now, you know, one thing's for sure, see, there is pushback from enterprises, right? You know, of course, as expected. And the rate of price increases is one major. Right? The way things stand, we are still some distance away from overall market price reduction or heavy discounting. Now, having said that, there's still a lot which many enterprises can do, right? Uh, the rates being paid still could be higher, right? Uh, um, and, and they could be optimized, right? Because everything is, is based on context. There's nothing which can be simply taken as a market trend and, and everyone blindly agrees. Um, or non-rate commercial levers could be, could be optimized. I mean, I personally believe that, you know, there's only a handful right, of contracts which might be totally optimized, you know, as per market standards. There's still a lot which can be done on many of these, which seemingly appear, oh, we've got a great deal. Okay, so as we move to the next page, um, you know, this is something which we which we want to offer, right? Um, as a as a bit of a complimentary session, um, you know, the mega wage and rate hikes seen in 2022 for sure are unlikely to happen this year. Right? Now, um, if enterprises are wondering how to get the first mover advantage and ensure a competitive contract, uh, do feel free to sign up for a complimentary session. Uh, a discussion on the function and theme of your choice. Now, the functions and themes are listed um, here as well across IT apps, infra, structure, and BPO. Uh, and um, the theme could be one of either getting an optimized contract and bill rates, um, you know, exploring non-rate commercial levers to maintain a competitive total cost of ownership. And then finally, you know, most important sometimes, you know, are the contract clauses, right? Things like COLA, FX, which could make the entire difference between the overall cash outflow, um, which, which, which comes through. So please do use, um, you know, um, the, the, the chat window, which comes in and uh, click on the link and we'll be happy to set up a conversation. Just a, a, a just a quick note, this is, uh, this conversation is for, um, you know, enterprises only. Um, so thanks, thanks for that. All right, um, till now we have spoken about, you know, IT and BPO services and, and the way pricing potentially is gonna move. Um, moving to the next page, let's also try and talk a little bit about software license pricing. Um, so, yeah, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Avishek. So, you know, as I briefly talked about earlier about software licensing being one of the cost centers that's difficult to get savings from. And what has actually happened is most of these vendors, what they've done is they've bought a lot of functionality. And thus they've created a lot of value, you know, not just in terms of automation, but also efficiency. And this is why, you know, they've been charging a premium and they'll continue doing that. Uh, that is what we feel. So in fact, you know, we've also seen the way these uh, products have been marketed, you know, for example, just look at uh, NM365, which, has, uh, which Microsoft is now pushing and you'll see a gradual phase out of Office 365 for that example. So, you know, and then on the other hand, if you see, you know, what is happening is there's a lot of wage inflation due to which there has been impact on the R&D costs for these software vendors, which has directly uh, linked to the increase in software prices. Apart from that, I think one key trend that you might notice is that we're talking about push for long-term contracts. Uh, yes, you know, that is something that's going to impact the price increase 
negative way, if I say. You know, most vendors, they will be very happy to see a clear cash flow. And that is the reason, you know, we'll see a lot of long-term contracts that will invite a lot of discount. And we'll talk about some of that in uh, some slides uh, there. So what we've also seen, you know, some of these dominant vendors, especially the large platforms, you know, where you once invest, it gets very difficult to tra uh, transition. So that is where, you know, these uh, vendors, they typically show their strength and they increase prices as a strategy uh, to show their positioning in the market. So these, they may not rise every year, but, you know, sometimes uh, they... Uh, right whenever there's a new update coming a new version update coming that is when their time they increase so you know if we move to the next uh, next page we've tried to quantify some of these increase yeah so if you see what we've done is we've created two buckets here and one from five percent to as high as 20 percent increase whereas one where there is up to five percent increase so uh if you see the first bucket, you will see there's a very wide range around it. And that is to do what's happened is we've seen a lot of legacy contracts, which have been very favorable to the buyer. And these are no longer be no longer being renewed in the same construct, same pricing construct. And this is what often leads to a very high increase. And this, and usually these are the ones which would fall, you know, 15 to 20% increase kind of an increase. So also what we've seen is, you know, some mission critical softwares, you know, which have, which have occupied a dominant position in the market of platforms where there's a major version update that would also fall in this particular bucket. And uh, coming to the second bucket, most of the softwares are going to lie in this bucket. So basically this increase is largely to do with Cola. We've seen, and some interesting thing that we've seen in a lot of the contracts have this price protection cap, especially, you know, when enterprises are contracting for a long term. And this is a very, uh, this is a great way actually uh, to decrease, uh, protect yourself from any steep price increase. So uh, I'll hand it over to you, Abhishek, for the next. Great. Thanks, Ron. Um, you know, again, like like I said, you know, services is one part. There's also kind of, you know, the whole software element and it has a, uh, many of the factors are similar, which contribute to inflation, but there's just, you know, so much of a different dynamic, uh, which, which you know, buyers can, can explore. Okay, so uh, let's move to the next section, uh, which is all around actions to capture outsourcing savings. So just in terms of, you know, summarization of the discussion till now, uh, the shape of 2023 in terms of pricing is likely to be different as compared to 2022. How different it is in magnitude, only time will tell. Um, which is why, you know, for the first time ever, we looked at two different scenarios and how they could play out. However, um, you know, we believe that enterprises um, cannot afford to wait for months to plan and act, right? Uh, in this session, in this section, we'll try and speak about five key actions which enterprises should focus on to ensure, um, you know, outsourcing savings, right? Um, so, Shitika, over to you to discuss action number one. Thanks, Abhishek. So, um... Let's start with the first action item for the day. So sole source deals or having too few competitors in the outsourcing mix is ideally not advisable. And especially in the present scenario, more to say. Um, it's a no brainer that having competition in the play right from the proposal stage actually helps avoiding overpaying. In fact, uh, we have also seen enterprises better deal with resource fulfillment where multiple providers were there in the mm -hmm. ecosystem. Now let us go through some of the key aspects to look out for while considering any price revision request. Okay. So um, it becomes imperative for the buyers to look out for valid rationale behind any price request that they're getting from the suppliers. So simply put, price increase is unwarranted for contracts that are already priced towards the higher side of the things. And uh, while traditional AMS and development solutions are standardized up to an extent, um, there is still room for a lot of, you know, um, bloating in effort or solutions in system integration and transformation deals. So that is some area to watch out for. And in such scenarios, it is all the more important for the enterprise to be wary of elements like pyramid, the kind of shoring that has been put in, uh, the utilization consumed. Um, and different other factors as well. So 
Abhishek, uh, we have come across a few instances where the service providers were pressing for, you know, uh, double digit price increases in the existing rate cards, and also sometimes in the tune of 20 to 25%. Uh, what yeah. do you think would be the plausible reason for such astounding request? Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, Shritika. So, uh, see, uh, in, in some cases, we did see that this was perhaps you know, posturing, right? That even after major pushback or negotiation, they end up with a 10 to 12 percent increase, you know, if they ask for 25, right? So, so that's that's one set of cases. The having said, you know, context is key. Um, so there also have been cases where 20, 25 percent was justified as the previous pricing was just unsustainable, right? You know, sometimes it was just hyper-competitive pricing that was agreed, which gets somehow sustainable as long as the wages are in control. But then when they start shooting up, you know, it goes from a barely there margin to a negative margin, which then, you know, clearly uh, is not something which should work well for both sides, right? Because we believe that, you know, service providers also have the right to maintain and earn a decent margin. Hence, the need to understand fact-based rationale, as we call it, you know, nothing to take at a face value. Sometimes a 5% hike might be unjustified. In other cases, a 20% might be justified. So um, I, I think that's where, you know, putting the context in key, put, you know, trying to understand what's an actual example versus what's uh, a bit of posturing is, is super important. I think what will, uh, you mentioned an interesting point, you know, on the, on the previous page around, you know, including more uh, providers into the mix. The way, the way we see this as a continuum also is, that um, it, it won't be a surprise that in the coming months we see more of vendor consolidation. But rather than kind of straight away going into consolidation, what we're seeing some enterprises doing is saying, hey, normally uh, what happens is that a lot of the stuff might remain with one of the strong incumbents. Why don't we try putting some more into the mix and getting a bit of a feel of a trial around how this works, the culture, the ways of working, the flexibility, et cetera. So some part of this could also be seen as a precursor to eventually consolidating into, into one provider and then maybe even seeing provider shifts, right? So that's potentially, um, we don't know the extent to which that happens, but uh, but directionally, we see some of that um, having a high probability of happening. Uh, do you want to cover the two examples, you know, which we were talking about uh, sure. how, you know, enterprises yeah. have managed <laughs> to expand the pool? Yes, uh, so moving on to the next slide. It actually, you know, uh, this scenario is very much a validation of what you were just speaking about, Abhishek. Um, so while we have gone through some of the factors that we should keep in mind while discussing price changes, um, I'll also walk you through some examples of how enterprises are keeping a check on their outsource spend by simply introducing competition into the mix. So um, one of the leading BFSI company that we engaged with last year uh, was successfully able to incite competition at various outsourcing touch points and uh, by having just a healthy supplier mix into the play. In fact, um, this also translates into an opportunity for supplier assessment for any future agenda of vendor consolidation, like Abhishek, you just mentioned. Um, another example of competition being leveraged to tackle very you know, sharp rate increase request was a leading utilities company that brought in Indian providers into the mix. Um, the scope was around AMS and testing services. And the sole purpose of the enterprise was to have price negotiations and to deal with the challenges of resource fulfillment, which they were actually facing with the incumbent for the last years. So uh, that's some view on uh, how, how enterprises are kind of managing such scenarios. Now let's move on to discuss our next action for the day. Okay, so um, while we spoke about some tactical ways to go about managing price increase request, it is also very crucial to kind of highlight some of the non-rate commercial levers. Um, these are always at the enterprise's disposal to utilize to keep a check on the rate increase. And um, Often we see most of the discussions taking place only around the pricing aspect. Uh, however, we feel that you know, a well-framed contract with inclusions of certain commercial clauses can be equally helpful in managing the business risk. In the next slide, we will talk about some of these important commercial levers. Okay. 
So um, the last year, most of the conversations that we had were either around the hot topic of cola clause and around the impact of FX depreciation in major offshore locations. Um, interestingly, we have seen higher than before inclusion of the cola clauses in deal. And um, you know the reason could be an unprecedented wage increase uh, over the last 12 to 18 months, leading to an increased pricing pressure uh, from an operating cost standpoint on the service providers. And hence, we are seeing such you know, uh, push from the service provider aspect also to include such clauses into the contract. Uh, moreover, we also see uh, a lot of emphasis on adopting the right CPI metrics. In some cases, we've also seen discussions around um, wage matrices to be included instead of the standard CPI matrices. Now, um, while hyperinflation has led to some tough pricing conversations in the past year, we have also seen FX clauses coming into the rescue for um, many of these scenarios. Compared to before, we have observed an increased acceptability of the risk sharing of the FX between the buyer and the seller. And usually this is triggered at a, uh, you know, beyond a certain threshold. Uh, so that's the key here. So last year, we have also seen multiple scenarios of enterprises having hard negotiations uh, where they were leveraging the FX depreciation to kind of uh, offset the impact of wage increases and the justifications were made on those aspects. Uh, okay, so now beyond inflation, um, severe talent crunch is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, is actually in a lot of instances has led to discussions around alternate commercial models. Um, buyers and sellers alike, they have seen the limitations of the traditional models in place, where um, every penny of wage increase was in fact having an impact on the overall project cost. Uh, talent unavailability continued to persist because either resource fulfillment KPIs were not present or um, there were not penalties associated to these um, KPIs. So, even though it is still a very passive movement to more advanced models, uh, there is an evident shift from these stakeholders uh, to kind of you know, move to these complex commercial models eventually. Uh, again, another point is that um, it is very important to acknowledge that uh, these are not the kind of adoptions that are big bang changes. Um, you know, Consumption-based models like outcome, output-based constructs are meant to mature over a long haul and both parties need to get used to the idea of risk balancing. So that's the key here. Another point I would uh, like to make is uh, a very important consideration from a buyer standpoint, if uh, being open to re-evaluating existing matrices that are in place and also the stringency associated to these KPIs. So we have often observed oversight when it comes to realigning the performance priorities at the time of renewals. It is also very crucial that a careful evaluation of the performance metrics is jointly done by both parties. In fact, Rohan, I recall this large CPI, um, you know, retail client that we were advising last year. And uh, we had seen some very interesting aspects of joint governance. Uh, would you like to talk about, uh, you know, the importance of client participation? and especially from the standpoint of governance. Uh, yes, Shatika, I think you raised a very interesting point here. You know, you know this is something that uh, we are increasingly seeing. And a lot of this is to do with automation as a lever, you know, which is so often pitched in during the contracting phase and at great lengths. You know, often what we've seen is, you know, these enterprises, they get no visibility towards the kind of automation that's actually being implemented in the environment. You know, in fact, we've also seen instances where service providers have kept a buffer in commercials and are doing financial engineering to show those automation gains throughout the deal period. So I think that is the reason, you know, we now see most of the, many of the enterprises, in fact, going an extra mile to track these commitments, not just, and this is not just at a pricing level, this is more at an implementation level. You know, the greater focus is put on governance with increased involvement of the client who actually ensures that these things are actually implemented in, on the ground. So 
I think uh, if you sum it up, it's very important. You know, governance is now at a, at the forefront. You know, it's not just about just signing a deal and then uh, the client just taking care of his business and the IT being taken care of uh, by the outsourcer. Now it's now it's quite changing. There's a much more. Uh, there's a much more more effort by the client to actually see. You know what is happening on the ground. So I think now. If we go, I think we've been talking about software a lot in our previous slides. So let's, I think, go to the next page and see about it. So what we've already talked about is the potential of savings when it comes to software licensing. And we did say it was minimal, but yes, there is there are ways you can contract very smartly and save some money on the table. And that is exactly what we are going to talk about in the next slide. Yeah. So I think what we would all agree is that, you know, the length of the contract is going to make a significant impact in the savings, you know, but however, what is a difficult part is choosing the right tenure. So I think sometimes what happens is savings might not be the right lens to sign a contract. It is important that there is a clear strategy on what software tools are being leveraged in your IT environment, because, you know, it is important to assess whether what you are in, if you are investing in a single uh, platform, say, and for a long term, does that make strategic, uh, strategically, does that make sense? I mean, in this dynamically changing IT world, you need to have that clear vision around it. And what we see is, you know, if you look at one to three year contracts, these are something that usually invite, in, invite minimum discounts. And something like a long term contract, you see more than five years, up to seven to 10 years, we see there's an additional discount of 40 to 50%. But you know, when, it, when, you, when we talk about these so long term contracts, they are usually organizations who have a very clear vision, you know, what they want to do for the next five to 10 years. They are the kind of ones who invest in such uh, long contracts. Uh, Abhishek, if you have noticed something, you know, one thing that is common between IT services and software licensing is this sweet spot of three to five years. And that's correct. Is, yeah. And this is where we see, you know, most of the vendor enterprises negotiating. Do you still think, you know, with recession approaching everything, the focus towards cost savings, this is still a prudent strategy? Should the enterprises go to a longer contract still? Or is this the sweet spot you think that's still relevant? Yeah, absolutely, Ron. That that's correct. You know, one one may be tempted to go in for a longer tenure, you know, for clear economic benefits, uh, but for most platforms, you know, I agree the sweet spot is going to remain the three three to five year period. Um, you know, it's just the right balance between not getting tied into for a long time, and then get also getting fairly good levels of additional discounts. Right now, the similarity with services on this on this point is striking. I think the only exception might be for certain, you know, software where either um, there's just one player in the mix, right? For example, or so you know, so much has already been invested, you know, as an organizational strategy that it becomes very hard to kind of you know change. In those cases, one might want to consider you know long-term ones, but for others, I think with the pace of change generally in the industry or in terms of you know the the way newer companies are coming in and how things may evolve, three to five seems like a sweet spot. Now, you know, when we talked about the similarity with, with services, now with services instead of discounts, right, um, you know, because there's really no sticker price for IT services, right, for application development, AMS, uh, everything is down to the underlying kind of scope and context. The factor to consider generally is how the absolute pricing compares with market norms, and which takes us to the next action item, which is action item number four. Now, this is important because, um, you know, just like each fingerprint is unique, each individual, each human space is unique. Um, you know, the same, I believe, is true for the commercial competitiveness of a contract, right? There's just so many more moving parts uh, that something which was competitive a year ago uh, may not be today, right? And vice versa. 2021 and 2022 have also taught us that underpricing has a severe impact on talent availability. Um, so hard negotiations to the last dollar and dime uh, may not be preferable for, for all situations, right? There's a time and place for that. There's a, there's a set of portfolios for that, but you know, painting everything with the same brush you know, has, has had adverse consequences uh, many times. So believe, we believe there are three key points to highlight um, in terms of how to use external market pricing intelligence uh, effectively, as we see um, on the next page. 
Okay, so um, you know the pace of change in commercials is unprecedented. So the first myth is that any external data from 18 months, two years, three years ago can be used as is. Right? So you know this is where um, it's important because both underestimation and overestimation would lead to adverse consequences. Um, you know, these could be around talent availability, quality issues downstream. Uh, overestimation obviously is going to kill the business case um, in, in terms of you know the, the overall pricing dynamic. The second element to highlight is that uh, it's not just about data. Right? Data by itself maybe hides more than it, than it reveals. Um, you know, things around the contextualization and how to use it smartly is, is super important. You know, what's the right nomenclature alignment? What are the underlying assumptions, you know, underpinning the unit-based sort of fixed fee? You know, what really goes inside it? Um, uh, what's, for example, you know, the solution size and growth might counteract the impact of, uh, of the ostensibly, you know, low pricing. So, for example, we've seen in many cases, uh, just taking the case in point, a couple of months ago, we were working on something uh, around a systems integration you know, proposal review for a Fortune 500 organization where one of the leading providers had given it. Um, and we were in that review and we figured out that those pricing, that the pricing applicable for certain resources, be it for change management, tech, functional, it was all super competitive. But just the amount of estimation that they had put in in terms of number of hours somehow just bloated the PCO a lot and, and it almost negated the impact of, of ostensibly competitive pricing, right? So that's where, you know, a component level view, a holistic view is, is really, really important. The final element is all about ROI. You know, what's the ROI of such an exercise, right? What if this ends up in nothing? You know, how can I be, you know, guarantee that, that you know, something will come up? Now, in hard number terms, um, you know, 90% plus cases where we have worked, we've seen a short-term ROI of such an engagement of anywhere between 5 to 20x, right? Let's also not forget that the intangible value of knowing exactly where the gaps are, as opposed to here, say, like, hey, my friend told me or my buddy told me when we were having a cup of coffee, you know, really, um, you know, that's, that's something... Um, which, you know, a fact-based approach is much, much better than that. So, uh, and eventually, you know, the downstream impact has to be a better relationship between both parties so that we can get the right amount of flexibility, the right amount of, um, you know, uh, the, the, the service delivery, which you have contracted for. So that's kind of, you know, just, just a short view on, on how to approach things in a more in a fact-based manner, um, you know, effectively. Uh, Rohan, I think we've saved the most in interesting action for the law, right? So no discussion on pricing, ROI is complete today with a without a discussion of cloud. Um, so as we will discuss in the next section, I think. Now, of course, Abhishek, you know, I think in today's scenario, there's no conversation on pricing or solutioning of IT services that can do without the mention of cloud. You know, the kind of disruption that COVID-19 has caused has really transformed the whole cloud landscape, if you think about it. You know, we've seen such a massive scale of adoption. You know, but the question that I have, Abhishek, is, you know, how many of these transformations have actually yielded an ROI? You know, you hear so many CTOs talking about and saying, you know, they're yet to see an ROI. And a lot of these actually led these transformations, and some of them actually were over-eager to follow the herd. And, you know, we, and this is something that we still hear, you know, we say that, you know, the recession will again speed up the adoption towards cloud. So, you know, what is important is in this environment, all enterprises do a proper due diligence before moving to a cloud. And that's very important. So, you know, if we move to the next page, uh, where we will talk about certain aspects of this. So, one thing that one must remember is, you know, there are many use cases to cloud, which are absolutely great for business. But at the same time, you know, there are a lot of factors to consider when making a business case. And, you know, moving to cloud must be a strategic decision that is not just guided, that's not just guided by short term commercial benefit. You know, what one must assess is and understand is the key objective behind such a change. Is it cost? Is it scalability? So, you know, what we do is we see a lot of organizations that take a very myopic view and they lose sight of the long term. And this is where, you know, key stakeholders must assess the need to go towards the cloud. Uh, Shitika, if you remember, you know, recently, I think last month that was there, we had a meeting with an enterprise and they were discussing about migrating to cloud. 
and I was really surprised, you know, they had a very stable environment. They didn't face any, any issue, many, many key issues they did not face them. They were very stable in terms of uh, the environment. And it was really surprising for me, for them to go for such a big transformation also at this uncertain period. Absolutely, Rohan. Um, in fact, this scenario is a very good example of a lot of enterprises jumping onto the bandwagon of cloud adoption. And at times they're also seen giving away their data centers entirely. Our recommendation is to um, you know, have the flexibility card always in your pockets as enterprises, um, even if the business decision is to kind of embark on the cloud journey. So um, things like you know, hybrid models of cloud adoption or um, you know, having cloud agnostic solutions will definitely help reduce the overall business risk for you as an enterprise. So um, I think that summarizes the five actions we had on cost saving for 23. Um, over to you, Abhishek. Sure, uh, thanks, Shitaka uh, and Rohan. So uh, I think let's let's get to the the you know answering some questions that as I mentioned we we keep some some time at the end uh, for that. So um, let's let me just quickly moderate a few right. We we'll pick and choose from some that we've received you know right now and some uh, participants had sent questions you know, beforehand as well. So um, you know one of the questions which which came in was um, around you know what successes have been observed based on shifting to more output based pricing right you know as as perhaps we discussed in a previous webinar uh, and what are some of the impacts um Shethaka, do you want to cover that uh, sure Abhishek. so uh, a very interesting question uh, we have seen in fact a lot of you know enterprises benefiting from a well-rounded consumption-based contract um, organizations have achieved reduction in overall cost of ownership uh, we've seen them achieving greater flexibility in managing their, uh, you know, volume fluctuations. And these are also only possible when uh, clearly defined metrics are in place. So, in fact, the key is to identify the right metrics and uh, the right kind of environment that it fits in. There has to be a marriage between the two. And then uh, eventually strategizing well for transitioning into these complex models. Perfect. Thanks. Um, another one which which came through was um, again, you know, highly competitive races, you know, often leads to impact on service quality, right? You know, and and that failed to meet expectations in in the long term. Um, and and the ask was, you know, how how do we really measure how value can be measured, right? Or how we kind of you know, uh, how do we define value and and its measurement kind of approach. Um, um, so that you know, effectively, companies are protected from over commoditization. Uh, Rohan, you and I were discussing, and, and you had a, a perspective on that. Yeah, Abhishek. You know, I think it's a very pertinent question. I think a lot of people have the a lot of enterprises as well as service providers do have this question. And you know, to be under uh, to be honest with you, you know, understanding the objective and the focus around the quality of delivery of services is very important. You know, we've seen watertight contracts where you know quality of services measured using variety of metrics, and it's very important to ensure that when you are looking at quality in terms of service. Now, uh, one thing you know, I think this talk about value. Now, value is a very relative term, to be honest. You know, it depends from an enterprise to an enterprise. You know, a company whose objective is to control cost would certain certainly see value in a highly competitive race. You know, where and someone who might need a balance between quality and prices, they might see the situation in a very different way. So, what is really important is for a seller, it is important that they identify the need of the buyer. What is the objective of the buyer? And for the buyer, in this case, an enterprise is very important to clearly articulate what their objective is, what they want. Is it quality of service? Is it competitive pricing? What they're looking for? Because at the end of thing, everything comes at a cost. You know, some will your service and your cost, they are not, they are actually kind of inversely proportional, if I say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was another question around, you know, what are the trends that IT providers should look out for, you know, and are there any alternative models that we see emerging into the future? So, you know, we always maintain that both parties should get an equitable deal, right? Uh, in the coming months, you know, obviously providers need to ensure 
that whatever pricing, whatever arrangement they have commercially with their clients um, is defensible right? using a data-driven approach. Um, and, and we've seen that over the past many, many years. You know, anyone who does that effectively, it could be internal data, external data, rather than hearsay and random economic metrics. Uh, no, it doesn't make a cut. The clearer, the sharper one is, it's important. Now, for a fair margin, you know, providers also need to be open and, dare I say, assertive about models which may be a bit more output focused, right? You know, high risk, potentially high margin ones for managed services, you know, exploring moving into kind of a per unit kind of model, right? Um, you know, more from an input or FT based model. Um, and in the whole process, the important thing is that the client should see uh, an intent and actual delivery of TCO reducing. But at the same time, you know, it for the provider, it could get compensated by a higher margin. So this, this is more like a win-win where the provider is also incentivized, you know, to innovate, to put in the right investments, to get more done for less. Yes, the overall revenue may reduce, but that potentially gets overcome by more on the margin side. And in many cases, we have seen that, you know, if clients see that thing happening and getting you know, more stuff done for less, there's much more of a chance that, you know, that extra, you know, delta revenue loss comes through in other projects, which could be transformation related, uh, which could be kind of automation related, consulting driven, um, and, and there's, there's a lot more around that. So, so yes, a slightly longer term view, uh, a, a more kind of, you know, risk skin in the game view is important. There were also a couple of uh, quick questions which came on the chat right now. Uh, which was around distinguishing between output and outcome. Very, very fair question because you know there's there's a lot of you know misnomers or or slight tangential understanding which uh, sometimes you know goes across in the industry. So the way we define output is effectively something where the pricing is linked to the actual activity being done, right? So per call answer is an output, per ticket handle is an output. Is an output. Outcome is, is a bit further down the line. So think of anything which is related to the actual impact of the activity would be outcome. So for example, any if it's a sales contact center, right? you know, sales, outbound sales, any sales made, you know, and a price linked to that or a percentage of revenue earned, that's an outcome because that's an end outcome. Another example could be, you know, increase in enrollment rate of healthcare platform. That's an outcome. Right, uh, or kind of you know procurement outsourcing related savings. That's an outcome. So you know just to be clear, that's how we are defining um, you know these two these two um, you know activities. Uh, let's take maybe maybe a couple of uh, other questions. Um, you know, let me see. Okay, uh, this was another one. You know, uh, which I'll try and answer. So how does the use of cloud knock on into potential further value realization in the application state, which is now situated on the cloud? Um, now, uh, the, I'll, I'll share some examples or some kind of you know, broad ranges, which we've seen, just a bit of a caveat that these could again be highly contextual, right? It depends on a lot of factors. But uh, for application development, they could be material you know, effort reduction, 20 to 30, 35%. Uh, whereas in you know AMS application maintenance for applications which are on the cloud, uh, it could be twenty to thirty percent effort reduction as compared to you know, similar uh, situations in a non-cloud environment. Right? Now the actual cost impact might be lower because the numbers have told you are effort reduction as lesser tenured resources may be impacted. But uh, but yeah, this was more in terms of you know an effort uh, overall reduction. Now, this is made possible by you know, things like ready-made predefined services, um, simpler prototyping, for example, testing, faster release cycles. Um, and all of these have an overall, overall impact to reduce uh, you know, downstream applications effort uh, once you know, things have moved uh, onto the cloud. And enterprise clients are also expecting providers to have uh, some of this reflected in the pricing uh, you know, going forward. Uh, I think the last question we'll take is, uh, uh, Rohan, I think a similar one around how can we contain costs but maintain high quality of services? Do you, you want to maybe, you know, retouch on that? Yeah, I think it's quite a similar question to we had uh, last time. So I think it's important to have that clear focus and clear strategy around the key area that you actually want that delivery to be very high. So, I mean, if you are going to say that, you know, we want a high delivery across the board, high quality delivery. Yes, I mean, that is certainly going to cost you. 
at the end of the day, nothing comes for free or for uh, nothing comes cheap in this world. So that is clearly going to cost you. But you know, at the end of the day, it's about balancing between certain services that might impact your business and between certain services where you are able to con compromise. You know, you can keep lenient SLAs around certain services and that is where you know you can reduce your overall cost so it's about maintaining that balance knowing your business very well yeah absolutely uh there's another interesting question which, which just came up i think three or four minutes back on on, on the window you know how can be uh, how can a supplier be encouraged to support a client having a high degree of uh, contract uh, contract flexibility so this this is you know the the continuum or you know the the tension between a lot of flexibility on one hand and also kind of you know getting to the most competitive fee you know you can't really have both at the same time and I'll just paraphrase what I mean so and this doesn't mean overpayment by the way right all this means is that you know whenever there is a certain degree of flexibility required let's say there's a lot of things which are still in flux it's not being crystallized. Um, it's very important for you know the enterprise to be very very open with um, with with the suppliers to what those kind of open areas are right. What are the things which could move one way or the other? Uh, and the sooner one gets into a discussion open, um, you know, around what the commercial implications for some of the added transparency may be, what the timeline implications are, the better. Right. So that just makes it very clear so that there's no surprises. And sometimes we've seen, you know, clients actually sitting down together and quantifying that, okay, this is this kind of a change or this kind of a flexibility will have this much of a more cost impact. And the supplier can be transparent as to what's really causing that. That's one. The second element, of course, which we which we say is that if things are going to be negotiated down to the last possible dollar, come what may, uh, as in, you know, super hyper duper aggressive negotiation, right, if there is any word like that, um, then I think it needs to be in places where it's all about just getting stuff done in the most lean way as possible, right? Things like flexibility, innovation. Yes, there will be in the contract, there will be in the proposal, but in real life, we've seen clients really, really struggle with that uh, to get it off the ground. So I think it's very important to take a well-rounded view. Both parties should benefit from the arrangement um, any deal where one party says, oh, well, we've really got the best of them um, is going to be a lose lose for both of them, right? It has to be something where uh, both parties, you know, are invested in it. Um, otherwise, it just remains, you know, tactical and transactional and clearly nothing really comes out of it. Right? That's, that's just our view. Okay, um, I think that's, uh, we're coming, uh, you know, close to the end of it. I'll just take maybe 30 seconds to, to cover this. Page, um, you know, we assessed as Everest Group procurement teams in capturing value uh, through memberships and focus projects. Um, you know, both uh, if you look at outsourcing excellence, which is all about best in class market intelligence, and then of course pricing analytics as a service, where um, you know we have access to price benchmarks, performance management, policy contracting, basically anything and everything to do with uh, the commercial health um, you know, of the contract. Moving on. Um, you know, on the next page, we will, uh, you know, I just, before we close out, uh, yeah, just a little bit of a snippet on the functions we cover within pricing analytics as a service, uh, the locations that we cover, um, and uh, the kind of skills and data points. So uh, do feel free uh, to reach out to us um, if we can help with anything related to the pricing and contracting domain.